went to Rostovall, a new show organised by Hubnut, iDriver Classic and Furious Driving. The show took place at the British Motor Museum in Gaydon and there was a huge variety of cars there, over 800 turned out. And this is the first of two videos we're making from the show. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified when part two goes out later this week. This Wartburg was one of the last produced in 1991 in East Germany, after which the factory closed, with the 1.3 being the very last model it produced. This actually used a Volkswagen engine, and eventually the factory was bought by Opel. Another of the last of its line, this Ford Consoles from 1962, the final year of manufacture for the model, before it was replaced by the Granada, part next to one of many Rover 75s at the show in Wedgwood Blue. Although the 1.8 Z3 was widely panned, this 1.9 has 20% more power than the 1.8 and as a result, a much more respectable sub 10 second 0 to 60. 1971-73 9 is notable as it was the first to have an H pattern gear stick instead of a dog leg first. Final year cars seem to be a theme at this event. Made one year before the second generation Renault 5 or Superfied debuted, this 83 example is in remarkable condition. This Triumph Herald 1360 has actually been restored twice by the same owner, first in the early 90s and then again during lockdown. Besides Vitesse bumpers, an overdrive and an alternator, it's fairly standard and looks like a nice, honest resto. This Cortina is powered by the 2.0-litre Pinto engine that found its way into countless kit cars over the years. The GXL, or the Grand Extra Luxury, also came with the 1600 variant later in production and could be easily spotted thanks to its vinyl roof. I love a good Trevor, and the Chimera V8 is one of my favourites, with the V8 always sounding so good. The interior of these cars is pretty incredible, but it's always interesting trying to watch people get into it, because the door release is actually underneath the wing mirror. The Citroen GS sat between the 2CV and the DS in the Citroen lineup, and in this case has become a small van, and later went under the GSA badge in 1980. I always love a prancing moose, and this one has some pedigree to it, because this GLT has been to the Nürburgring, lapped, and lived to tell the tale. 240s are built like tanks and seem to go on forever, so it's not uncommon to find one that's been to the moon and back on the odometer. And next to it, this Lomax is the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It's two-seater, not very practical, and a much, much smaller engine, but it's still just as much fun. And it has a really nice rainbow metallic paint. Elsewhere, the pop-up headlights were out in force with this Mazda 323 parked up right next to another pop-up headlight champion, the Volvo 480. But this one seems to be having a spot of bother. Hello, my name's Jason. This is my um, Volvo 480 GT. Uh, we bought it as a barn find about three years ago. Um, no M&T, obviously, um, and it had been used by a mouse as, a, as his home. Uh, he'd chewed through all of the interior, all the seats, the underside of the seats, the foam had gone. Um, it also found its way up into the roof line in, the headline in, and uh, you could find lots of bits of chewed plastic up there. Um, so we've we've taken the headline in out. We've replaced that. We found a GT that had hit a, an oak tree, uh, but the the interior was correct, um, with the unique to this the the GT model. Um, so we've replaced that with the original seats and the interior, and got an MOT on it. So far, touch wood, it's not needed anything mechanical until today, when uh, as we were pulling up, we split a, a hose and we've. Um, We've dumped all our fluid out, so hopefully we're going to have a bit of a bodge and a bit of gaffer tape and a few cable ties. We should be able to hold some water in it and get it the 90 or so miles home. So yeah, now it's now it's got an MOT and it's hopefully by the end of the day running again. Um, next to do is sort of a little bit of body work. It's had new rear arches tacked in, uh, but I just need to grind them and fill them and spray them correct colour. Um, that's sort of it. Next will be sort of engine. The engine's not original. It's the correct engine, but it was came out for 440. Um, the previous one was not salvageable, but that came came with the car. It was it had already been changed, and he'd done the cam belt and the 
the clutch and everything. So touch wood, that should all be fine. Just unfortunately, a bit of rubber has, has decided to perish and split today. Some classic police machinery on show here with this 1974 Rover P6 2200, a common sight until it were later replaced by the SD1. Next to it, a much less common sight, this is a Moss Monaco, which is a body replacement for the Triumph Spitfire or Triumph Herald chassis. You could also get a chassis direct from Moss, which would suit a Ford Pinto and running gear. Best I can tell is this is registered as 1500 This is one of those Pinto chassis cars with an early low compression 1.6 from a Cortina or maybe a Capri. Honda S660 always struck me as being a superb B-road weekend car. Wheel at each corner, a turbo three-cylinder engine, and a mere 850 kilos to throw about should make for a great drive. And it's parked next to something a little less throwable, a Citroen Diane. Evolution to the 2CV to compete against the Renault 4, which took a huge number of sales after it arrived in 1961. I had no idea this was a Volvo, but since it's derived from a DAF 66, and particularly without the arrow grille, which is an ancient symbol for iron apparently, it goes under the radar a bit, unless you really know what you're looking at. Something I didn't realise before was the Princess models were never actually badged and sold as Austins, other than in New Zealand, although many are still registered as either Austin or Austin Morris. Parked next to this Princess 2 is a very early Mark II Cavalier saloon. 1988 was the first year for the Mark II, and apparently it was amazingly fuel efficient for its time. Here we have a trio of hot hatches. First up, a 1989 Fiesta XR2, one of the very last as the third gen Fiesta debuted in the very same year to replace this body style with a much more rounded affair. Next up, a 1987 Volkswagen Golf GTI, and although it's a Mark II, this is a pre-facelift version which is easily noticeable by the separate quarter light on the door and the mirror being mounted further down. Finally, the Escort XR3i, built to compete in the same size segment as the GTI, and unlike the XR2, this one has fuel injection, as denoted by the I at the end, which the XR2 would later get in the third gen. I saw written somewhere that the NSU Prince looks like someone put a Chevy Corvette in the hot wash and shrank it, and after seeing both of them, albeit not side by side, I kind of agree. The Beltline has a lot of similarities, even if it is missing two doors and a lot of space. This Citroen BX is still sitting proud atop its hydropneumatic suspension, which is clearly still working perfectly. This limited edition TGS Meteor trim has survived pretty well and is apparently one of only three left on the road. Hi, I'm James from Auto Animals. Uh, this is my Arbath Grande Punto, um, one of less than 250 left on the road, we believe. Um, I managed to rescue this from a car dealer in Clacton <laughs> for, well, a few years ago now. Uh, it's a 2009 1.4 turbo uh, petrol. Uh, it's been mapped unbeknown to me to 190 horsepower um, yeah it's my pride and joy this is Luca so this is uh, one of the fleet we've got at Auto Animals we've also got uh, there's the Mark II Kia Cell which is like the crew car we've got a 996 911 we've got we did have a Freelander one RIP uh, we've got a Disco 3 heavily modified probably the only two-seater Disco 3 you'll ever find uh, and we have a Triumph Stag as well, which is uh, due to come out of hibernation very soon, appearing on somebody else's YouTube channel. I can't say who yet. Um, so yeah, we've got plenty of other videos coming up, uh, plenty of rustable videos. Um, so go subscribe and uh, check out some of our channel content. The Parodua Nipper lasted four years in the UK, but the Cancel, as it was called almost everywhere else, was in production until 2009, almost without visual change. The engine is a Daihatsu, and the car was sold under that brand in Indonesia until 2006. And from the plain and practical, we move to the fun and loud of the Triumph Spitfire 1500, the fifth and final iteration of the Spitfire model, and the first of them to crack 100 miles an hour. Unbelievably, these only had 53 horsepower in their US guys, thanks to an EGR system and a cat being fitted for smog compliance. Next 
next door to the Spitfire, packing a few more cylinders and a lot more displacement, a Jaguar XJS. This one carrying a number of Tom Wall Control Racing or TWR improvements, including wheels, body kit, and a variety of performance improvements to the engine and suspension. And finally, the last car of this episode, a Hillman Imp. Named Pele, in what I'm guessing is not a factory colour, but looking great regardless. There was a huge turnout for this event, and the next Rustival is on the 28th of September 2024 at the British Motor Museum. Huge thanks to Ian and Carly from Hubnut, Steph from iDriver Classic, and Matt from Furious Driving for making Rustival happen. And if you've just found our channel from this video, why not subscribe? We've got another episode in the works just from this event. And if you're wondering what became of the Volvo that was having coolant issues, eventually the AA had to come out. It wasn't repairable on site, and I think the head might have warped. Sad times. Thanks very much for watching. Once again, make sure you subscribe to the channel for the next videos that are coming and all of our other road trips along with the rest of our projects, and we'll see you in the next video.